Well, good morning, everyone. And um, sorry that I cannot see you. You can't see me, but you'll get my voice here over the, the speaker. Um, I knew when I agreed to come and speak at this, one of my first questions was, I hope you were gonna send me nice weather. And unfortunately, um, that didn't happen this time, but I look forward to maybe another chance to do that. But um, I am a professor in agronomy at Kansas State University in Manhattan. And my main role is research and teaching in the area of weed science. Um, if you do have other questions after today's session, there's my email um, that you are welcome to, to send things to me and I'll, I'll respond back to those. But part of um, my presentation today will be a little bit of a reflection on the work we've done in Kansas. And over the last couple years, we were getting a lot of uh, requests from our farmers um, demanding information on how we could use it for weed suppression. And so I had been working in um, projects in this area for about 10 years, but all of a sudden there was just that much more interest in understanding what they could do for us. And um, just to give you a, another sense of Kansas, we are very diverse as we look from west to east in the sense of our, our crop rotation and where we could potentially fit a cover crop in there. So that put a, another challenge in there to understand you know, how could we um, make these cover crops fit. And I hope with some of these examples um, and the work we've done um, will help those of you in Iowa where your cropping system's a little bit different and maybe a little more lenient than um, ours is in Kansas. But we go from the west where it's a typical winter wheat fallow in a two year cycle to maybe increasing um, the intensity of our crop rotation from winter wheat to grain sorghum fallow. Um, if we get a little more rain, we could add in the corn versus grain sorghum with soybean winter wheat. And then as we get into the southeast corner towards Missouri, Arkansas area, we're up to a corn winter wheat double crop soybean. So three in two years. Um, as we look at each of these systems, that fallow period where we think we can insert cover crop becomes shorter. And so we have to really think of different things um, to fit into that. One of the reasons we see um, such a diverse kind of cropping system across the state is based on this map and rainfall patterns and those nice rainbow colored stripes. Um, each color change indicates a couple inches less rainfall as you move from right to left. And the stars indicate some of the research locations that we've been doing um, work. The far left star is Colby, Kansas where we have a research center. Um, the center one is near Hayes, um, where we also have another research center and there's been cover crop studies done in both of those places. Um, the star second to the right is a, a farmer's field that we have been um, sampling um, cover crops and weeds um, there and then also the far right star. So the two on the right are farmers, the two on the left are research stations. There's many more that we have done um, in the past, but just to give you a sense of some of the fields that I'll be talking about. But that rainbow color just influences what kinds of crop rotation sequences we have and where, what weeds we may be concerned about and um, what kind of cover crops might fit best in those environments. The other key thing when we're thinking of weed suppression is that we each need to identify what our key driver weed species are, those that we are really worried about those that drive our decisions on what we're doing to manage the weeds. In Kansas, again, we are very diverse from east to west. Um, kochia is our a significant problem in the western two-thirds of the state. Palmer amaranth, we have had in our state um, 20 years longer, um, but it's come up from the south. It's a problem across our corn, um, grain sorghum, soybean areas. Uh, water hemp and horseweed are our eastern Kansas weeds. And these drive the decisions that our growers are making um, for management, especially because many of them have developed a single or multiple resistance to herbicides um, through the time that we've been managing them. So one of the reasons why a lot of growers are looking at uh, cover crops and also um, we have these long fallow periods where these weeds really take advantage of it. And so can we do something different than spraying another time or doing tillage, especially in our uh, low moisture environment where we really encourage no-till and to manage these weeds with some other tools. So what I'm gonna do today is walk through these five questions. I don't have a recipe for you, but I want you to challenge you to think of how each of these 
um, fit with your operation and with what you're thinking about and um, would help guide you in making some decisions on if uh, cover crops would help you with lead suppression. So we'll talk about what's, you know, what's your goals? What do you want to accomplish with a cover crop in the first place? And if that's a decision you're gonna make, how will you plant it and when? Um, what's gonna be before and after that cover crop in your rotation um, as it influences um, the choice and, and things you have to do in your main cash crop. Finally, you get to make the decision on which cover crop will you plant. And then of course, once it's up and going, we need to understand how to terminate it. So I will work through these five questions and throw in uh, research data and, and information that we have gleaned um, through the time that we've been working on this. <clears throat> so of course the first question is what do you want to accomplish? What is your goal of including a cover crop in your uh, crop rotation sequence in your farming system? I of course always put that I get weed management benefits at the top of my list but often that's one of the last ones that gets mentioned so I'm gonna promote it myself. Um, usually cover crops are out there with the goals to reduce or prevent soil erosion, the potential to reduce compaction by having something growing there with roots. Um, in Kansas, you could um, tell where people are from, east or west, because you may either be used conserving soil moisture or you're using excess soil moisture by having a living cover um, growing and using up that water. With those actions, we're able to protect water quality um, potential to reduce fertilizer inputs, um, either by fixing nitrogen because I've included a legume cover crop, or scavenging them by having roots that are going down deep and saving, say, residual fertilizer that wasn't used by the cash crop um, and, and bringing that forward to the next crop. By having those living roots and extra uh, plant material out there, we can add organic matter to the soil. And of course, um, another use for cover crops is to provide grazing resources. Um, several of the presentations I've been giving around the state, um, it's myself and usually our livestock extension specialist, and so the two of us balance each other off because there are different, very different goals if you're going after weed management versus what you might be doing to try to provide a grazing resource. I always put the other um, on my list of goals because folks may have other, other things that they are thinking about as well, um, and if you have some of those later, let me know. <coughs> But if we are going to get weed suppression benefits um, using cover crops, let me share with you some of the, the work that we've done to show that. Um, what got us really going on this again is that growers were curious to what extent were cover crops really suppressing weeds. And this was before soybean planting. And an organization in the state, No-Till on the Plains, um, was interested in uh, working with their growers to try to figure this out. And they received some funds from our Kansas Soybean Commission and then they heard me talking about suppressing weeds and they said, well, you must know how to ID weeds and, and figure out how to do that research. So come and help us determine if this is working. And where, for me, it was very interesting to see where the farmers were fitting cover crops into their um, cropping system. And so those are two things um, that these, this project worked. So here's one example. This was the second from the right star, Clay County, um, in the north central part of the state. This was uh, early in 2016. Um, we had a good spring, so the grower planted spring cover crops in March. And I went back out in June to look at what kind of cover crop biomass and weed biomass was present before the grower went in to plant soybeans. So I'm gonna use my arrow here. This was then um, the cover crop area. This was the bare strip that the grower left, didn't plant a cover crop, and I could then evaluate you know, what were the weeds like and what was the cover crop doing around this area as well as in the area that wasn't um, planted. And so this is a, a look at it from the side. Um, so I have a, my bare strip with um, weeds, no other weed control had been done. Um, the grower was using a mixed cover crop um, with about six different species. Three were cereals, there were some uh, safflower, clover, and radish in the mix, but he ran out. So then he just went with regular oats. And so the side is a, an oat cover crop. So I compared oat, bear, and then mix around the other side. When I went out in June to survey, um, in it, I used like a square meter um, area to count the weeds and, and harvest them to weigh their mass. And I had about 14 weeds in that square meter that weighed about 3.3 grams. But what I want to compare that to is that oat cover crop where I had about seven weeds 
and in the mix I was down to one. So from 14 to seven, I already cut my weed number in half, and then to the mixed cover crop, you know, by 90%. I could not really weigh the weeds that were left in the cover crop because they were so tiny. They were late germinating, they were just little cotyledons, there wasn't anything there to weigh. And so I'm, this is gonna come back, but I've been able to see across most of these studies that I can reduce my weed numbers by half, and then the size of them by 90 to 95%. It's a lot easier to control fewer weeds that are small. So this was the mix that the grower had used on the side. So as I mentioned, majority um, were uh, cereals, spring cereals, oats, forage barley, and a triticale. Had a, a clover in there at a low level, rapeseed, and safflower. The majority were the grasses in the, the biomass mix that he um, ended up producing. This grower um, planted green, and so planted June 7th um, for soybeans and then sprayed it out after that. So this is just some pictures of him doing that. I went back in August to assess, you know, any residual uh, effects of the cover crop, what was happening in that bare area versus not, were there effects on, on the soybean. And we could see that there was a clear impact on the size of the beans in each of those different areas. And on the bare ground, they were taller which didn't make sense to me. Um, maybe it did, then there was no competition from the, the cover crops. My oats only were about, uh, a few inches shorter and my mixture was way shorter. But you know what? In the end, height was deceiving because my soybean yields were lower in the bare and higher in my cover crop areas. And so maybe the, in the bare area, they were compensating for something else. But we clearly saw that there were some visual differences in the beans, but that did not translate directly the way we think. Um, into yields, but we were able, and I'll show you some more yield data just to emphasize the, how the impacts of cover crops are. <clears throat> um, we also have um, field experiments um, in the central and west part of the state, as I mentioned earlier. This is just a couple pictures from Colby, so the far northwest corner of the state. Um, again, these were cover crops that were drilled mid-March. This was um, after a sorghum crop, planted the cover crops in the spring, they were gonna terminate it to be able to plant fall, uh, winter wheat in the fall. So these were then let grow, uh, allowed to grow for quite a bit longer. Um, I went in in June to survey for cover crop biomass and we biomass and density, same as the other. Um, this picture on the bottom left is the fallow field area. This was a, a problem um, with kochia, Russian thistle, um, some grasses. But in the fallow area, we had 153 weeds in a square meter, so lots. Kosha can come up looking like a carpet, so plenty of weeds there. Um, I had three other cover crop treatments, spring peas on their own, cut it in half to 76 weeds. My triticale oat was clean. I could not find any weeds in that particular samples that I had. And then a three-way mix, I still had weeds, but again, a, a third of, or a half of um, what I started with. So again, my reduction of 50% or more with a cover crop that's growing and then dramatic reduction in the size of those weeds. Um, even though they were up, they were very small and tiny trying to grow under a nice cover crop mix uh, as you see up here in the right. So even though there was air or space in between the rows, you can still see a little um, soil, just a fantastic um, cover crop that was competing against these weeds that we were looking at. And just to show that from a, a data standpoint, the blue bars here are cover crop biomass from the scale on the left. Um, the red line indicates the mass of the weeds that were harvested from left to right are the fallow to spring pea, triticale oats to the three-way mix. Um, the peas tended to not produce as much biomass compared to the cereal crops, but clearly the biomass of the weeds dropped um, with when they were trying to grow with those particular cover crops. So again, just to, to summarize those observations as we were looking at these spring sown cover crops and that we saw 50% or more reduction in number of plants and 95% or more reduction in weed biomass. And again, this was across, you know, weeds that were relevant in those uh, particular field locations. Um, this is some work that we have published. We're very interested in looking at kochia. I know this may not be a weed that you see much up in the Iowa area, but for those other folks that may be um, at the meeting from other places, 
Um, unfortunately, there's no lines on here, just a whole bunch of dots. And that's sort of what we see. If we plant um, spring cover crop and think we're gonna get some reduction of kochia, um, it all depends on sort of the timing of when the kochia comes up and when the spring cover crop is seeded and comes up. And this looks like a shotgun blast. Um, so we really didn't see a big benefit of the spring cover crops. This was work done in Garden City, so the south southwest part of the state. Very dry, some dry years when this work was done. But we also looked at um, fall sown cover crops, and now I do see that if I increase my cover crop biomass, I can reduce my kochia biomass again significantly um, by having them there. So my fallows, this was the potential biomass that I could produce in uh, areas of the field with no cover crop. I had broadleaf fall sown cover crops that were like lentils and peas. We got a pretty good reduction of biomass. But then when I looked at fall sown triticale or triticale with either of those uh, broadleaf crops, we could flatline that biomass production at a very low level. And we didn't need a lot of biomass of the cover crop to be able to, to knock back that kochia. <clears throat> and so this just highlights understanding more about the weed and when does it come up and, and compete with, or, or when is it growing relative to what we might need to think about from these cover crop standpoints. <clears throat> and I'll talk about that here again in a minute. But of course, depending on your goal with your cover crop, we have a lot of costs that are potentially associated with it that need to be balanced with those benefits that we hope to achieve. Um, many of you are probably um, doing some of this, but we always, always need to be aware of the cost of the seed. Um, a lot of our cereals are, are reasonable cost that, um, that can get penciled out when we start adding legumes, which are very difficult to get going in our environment. The cost goes up. If we look at some of our radishes, you don't need as much seed, but the weight or the price per weight is, is a little bit higher. So we always need to be aware of that cost. Do you have equipment to plant, drill that cover crop in? Um, we know that you'll have one or more additional passes through the field in order to plant the cover crop as well as to terminate it. And can we combine that with other um, activities that are um, out in the field? Um, we do use up soil moisture, whether that's good or bad. Um, depends where you are and what your uh, overall rainfall situation is. We always need to be aware that some of our cover crops could become a future volunteer weed. Um, sometimes not all the seeds um, germinate in the, the time that you think they are. I know um, looking at Twitter once in a while you'll see someone pull up a purple top turnip in the middle of their soybean crop because it germinated during the season and it's like what what is this and there it came up later. In our area, we see a lot of cover crops going in after wheat harvest um, in that stubble, and then we're concerned about controlling the volunteer wheat that may be coming up in it and, and potentially being a green bridge for some of our wheat diseases. And, and so um, in visiting with growers that are successfully putting the cover crops in, they know what their neighbors are doing or what's in the field surrounding them, whether they actually whether they need to aggressively uh, control that winter wheat before they do their cover crop or if they um, can use that as part of their cover crop se sequence. So we then of course need to be aware of those other pest problems when we have um, more plant species out there. And of course then we need to uh, finish our cover crop and do we have the right timing and the ability to terminate it. Termination can happen in many different ways um, depending on your system, could be mowed, could be tilled and worked into the soil. Um, we've um, looked at roller crimping as a way to knock it down and majority of our growers are spraying out um, the cover crop. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So the next question, how will you plant it and when? <clears throat> and so um, we really need to step back and lay out what our crop rotation sequence is and where we potentially can fit a cover crop in. And one of the things that I've really um, learned in visiting with my growers is that those that have successfully put the cover crop in may have dramatically changed the kind of crop rotation that they've been working with. In order to beat the weeds and to um, take advantage of using cover crops and potentially these other benefits, they changed their rotation. And the other um, thing as an agronomist that really threw me was the willingness of some of these growers to really change the time of when they plant their crops. And you may have noticed the, the soybean grower was looking into June <clears throat> to plant. Typically our farmers here would be you know, getting going for soybean pr 
planting um, early May, mid-May. This grower was willing to wait until June. He did the same for his corn crop. And we may be a little more flexible in Kansas with a longer spring and fall season. But in Kansas, we plant either plant our corn really early in order to beat the heat and, and to get successful pollination or why not wait until after? And so he, he did that and was able to really incorporate that uh, cover crop into his sequence. I know as we move further east, we're trying to take advantage of as long a season corn crop as we can. Um, and I mean east as in the US, then folks are looking at the unique ways of interseeding and getting that cover crop into the crop in a different way. So multiple ways that we can uh, think of our crop rotation and fitting it in. The other key thing is that um, if we're looking for weed suppression, the driver weeds that we have will need to dictate when we recommend timing of our cover crop and establishing it. So as I mentioned, kochia, we really saw the spring seed of cover crops were not that helpful. Um, the kochia is coming up at the exact same time that the cover crops are and could get ahead of them. Horseweed um, in our area is also a fall emerging species and so those summer Late summer or fall winter cover crops are much more uh, effective on suppressing horseweed um, at that time. When we're looking at our pigweed species or other summer annuals, then um, if we can get a fall cover crop in, great, but those early spring March seeded cover crops have been successful for getting persistent um, residue into the cash crop to be able to help uh, suppress some of that Palmer amaranth and water hemp. So uh, one of the questions we had though, as we visit with growers, or as I talk and learn about research being done, say in Indiana, Illinois, and horseweed is an issue, they were highlighting a lot more summer emergence or spring. And so we really wanted to assess and see it, when did horseweed come up in Kansas to make sure we were giving the right recommendations. So this is a sliver of the Eastern half of the state and the stars indicate locations from the, the North of Kansas City there at Highland, Kansas, down to the southwest or southeast corner of the state, Parsons and Oswego. And over two years, we went out and surveyed um, horseweed emergence. So this is in the fall, we had rings, we counted and pulled horseweed out of these rings to document when they were emerging. Um, and this is just an example of the size um, in that fall. This is a dime, they are tiny, but look at all the leaves that are on there already and a challenge to manage. So we were interested in what, um, when were they coming up um, and then did they survive into the spring? So that's what the second ring at each pair was for, is how many of those that came up survived to the spring? And then, um, you know, just when do we need to worry about them? <clears throat> so these are what we call emergence profiles. Um, the one is for 2014-15 and the second is 15-16. This is in growing degree day, so we're using accumulated heat units um, at 13 degrees Celsius. What I want to emphasize is that the different colored lines go from north-ish to south-ish um, locations. And we see that in this blue upward line is um, first day of spring, so March. And so we wanted to see when do most of these uh, horseweed come up and the majority reaching, you know, 90%, 100 one, you know, full proportion was majority before that. And then we still get some spring emerging um, individuals, but you can see this green line towards our south locations that they got a little more um, later as well. And so as we go from north to south, we're seeing earlier, early emergence before winter to slightly more spring. And so here we can see a little more of the spring emergence, but here majority are in the fall. So that confirmed our goal to say we need to manage these in the fall. Um, this is another summary of uh, winter annual weed emergence um, conducted in Nebraska. Over a couple years, they seeded uh, these different weed species and observed when they emerged. The same kind of idea as uh, growing degree days and the profiles. This first line is uh, September, December, and March, um, days of spring. So you can see sort of where we're not accumulating a whole lot of heat units um, over that winter time period. But again, majority of these are those fall emerging um, <clears throat> species. Downy brome is the solid red line sort of at the beginning. Um, these green ones are our winter mustard species field, pennycress and shepherd's purse in this particular example. So they tend to be quite late and early, early um, in the spring. Uh, dandelion is this black dotted line, tends to be an equal opportunity half in the fall, half in the spring. But again, just knowing if some of these are your key weeds, when do they come up 
and when do I need to go after them with a cover crop or some other management. They may be really, really tiny, so you have to get out there to look for them. <clears throat> so to help with um, understanding what cover crop I might pick, this is a table from uh, Integrated Weed Management a publication put out by Michigan State University a few years ago. Um, and it summarizes sort of optimal seeding times for various cover crops. And if you need to look at fall seeded cover crops, then you know which ones are successfully seeded in August, September, into October. So here again is your winter cereal kind of crops. Um, which ones are better in the spring? So there's a series here that would be there. And which ones are kind of across the season? So some of our clovers um, can be seeded any time, but much better if they've got some season to go for it. In Kansas, after our wheat crop, Something like sorghum sudan grass is a great one that can handle the heat. We have some others like pearl millet and those things that allow us to go in after wheat harvest and have something that's competing through to frost um, in the fall. <clears throat> so stepping it back again to key weeds and suppression, you saw my pictures for kochia earlier. This is horseweed that we had studies done around Manhattan and um, we compared uh, herbicide treatments um, across the two different years and could we suppress it and compare that to a number of different uh, cover crop species that were either planted in the fall or in the spring um, and what was their level of control um, of our horseweed. And of course our herbicides if I do a fall residual so I burn it I kill what's there plus I have a herbicide that's going to keep them out. I was getting great control um, even with my fall no residual one year I got great control but I must have had later emerging ones in the second year so um, <clears throat> the residual was needed. Um, my spring, everything must have been up at the time that I treated it, and so I was able to get good control of small plants. But what I want you to look at is this winter rye with no herbicide, and I was getting 94, 96% across both years for suppression of horseweed. And so again, suppression is defined as fewer weeds and their size. And so we were able to, to dramatically do that with the winter rye. And in this case also, you're getting the benefit of having that crop growing there in the field compared to the bare field soils that we saw with our, our herbicide. So equivalent kind of levels of, of management with horseweed and, and using our winter rye. <clears throat> Transitioning into summer annuals, uh, Rodrigo Worley published this work that was done out of Iowa. Um, many years earlier and, and just had another look at it with a data analysis. And basically this is a ranking of early emerging to middle to late emerging species. The width of this line indicates um, the length of time that it continues to emerge. So Ivy Leaf Morning Glory is known to just continually emerge all season long. Um, the shorter it is, the quicker it is. So kochia, early, earliest emerging and the shortest. Within two weeks, everything is gonna be up that is. Um, and so this again just emphasizes what weeds are you looking for. So these are our early emerging weeds that we see that we would need a fall or something very early in the spring. These are my regular emerging ones. Most of my annual grasses are in this mix. And then these are slightly later and longer um, emerging ones. <clears throat> this work was done long enough ago that um, in the pigweed mix, Palmer amaranth was not in the picture yet. For you in Iowa, it is there now, but in different environments. Um, but I would say it would fall in the same place. We see it early to mid-May here, and it's quite uh, consistent and emerging through the season. So something to always be on the lookout for. <clears throat> so we have had studies um, also looking at what kind of cover crop impact do we have on Palmer amaranth. And we were, um, so this is a master's research project where we were looking at using winter wheat as a potential cover crop, because that's what we had out in the field in the fall. Um, as well as some spring seeded ones. <clears throat> so these are the two um, before termination. This is Palmer. It was already up and growing pretty significantly in this protected area in our uh, <clears throat> no cover crop treatment. This is the winter wheat. We sprayed it out before the seeds were formed so we had no problem with volunteer uh, wheat falling in. Um, this is the bare area left after planting soybeans with no cover. The rings are where we are documenting Palmer amaranth emergence here um, through the season. I just really, really like the, this particular picture. There's no difference in the soybean stand in either place, but I've got this wonderful residue cover of the winter wheat still standing um, here in mid-July. And there are rings in this plot trying to maintain and look for that Palmer amaranth emergence. 
So what was the impact on the, the Palmer amaranth? Um, again, I'm looking at red bars with biomass, blue bars with density, with no cover. I had quite a few, quite a, a large number of individuals, over 200 in a square meter, um, as well as then um, significant biomass production. When I go straight to my wheat, you can see that I've dramatically reduced that biomass that was um, able to be produced under that wheat cover crop and I reduced my density in half. So even though I only reduced it in half, the size of those individuals was dramatically smaller. My spring seeded covers, my oats did a really great job also of reducing um, <clears throat> the biomass and size. Our peas, we just didn't really get a good stand, but still you're getting a benefit of reducing the number of plants that are coming under any of those uh, cover crops mixtures. This was the cover crop biomass production. So you can just see we had a lot more biomass in the wheat to make an impact um, compared to our ability to grow some of these others. So again, experimentation, we learn things all the time. <clears throat> and these were just pictures, as you can see, our peas rode out nicely, but certainly didn't um, fill in the area that we needed it to. And then this was our spring oat cover crop. The residue wasn't as persistent as we saw with the wheat um, in this management, but still provided good residue where we weren't tracking over it. So this is what another interesting observation as Chelsea was observing uh, Palmer amaranth emergence patterns through time. Um, we've looked at this before. This is now on a calendar basis. How many out of 100% uh, percent, um, emerged? The black line was no cover. The blues are our mixtures and peas. The red is our wheat or oats. And this orange line is when 50% of the Palmer amaranth emerged. And we saw that in the no cover, our palm, Palmer emerged earlier, May 19th on average for 50%. We could push it a month later of, of when half of those weeds would come up <clears throat> under the weed and the oat cover crop. So what implications does this have? Well, um, my beans would be up and going. I'd have <clears throat> uh, some good cover. I'd have small weeds. I could delay, you know, when I'm going in to manage, but we can shift sort of what's happening to that Palmer amaranth um, emergence pattern and the numbers again then and their size um, by using these cover crops. We take advantage of that delay. Um, this then summarizes the, the soybean yield she saw in those plots. Um, we had also split um, a treatment that had no residual herbicide in the burn down application and then also with a residual. So again, the, the combining of multiple weed management strategies to manage these weeds. And we saw a big benefit of mixing it with the residual. In um, all our cases, our wheat yields um, tended to be you know, higher or equal to um, without the residual and even better um, with that residual herbicide in there, especially compared to the kind of yields we were getting with no cover um, in those environments. So our soybean yields benefited from any cover crop and especially the combination with additional weed management of that residual herbicide in there. <clears throat> okay, so back to number two, how will you plant it and when? Um, my emphasis here is that we wanna get that cover crop out there before that key point in the life cycle of the weed to get the best suppression. Um, what are the cover crops doing to, to provide the service? Um, they're reducing the amount of light reaching the soil surface. Uh, some of our weed seeds need that light trigger to say, hey, we're close to the soil surface, let's germinate and emerge. Um, so either the residue or a living mulch will smother and outcompete those weeds. We change the environment that the weed seeds are germinating in. They usually are triggered by certain temperatures, certain moisture conditions. If we keep it cooler, that'll delay it. Um, and if we can keep it extra wet, um, that may also then just delay that a little bit. We also get a lot of questions on what do uh, cover crops do um, in regards to releasing allele chemicals from their roots or decaying residue that may also inhibit that specific seed germination emergence phase. And so I'm gonna give some more detail on that here for a moment. What is allelopathy? Um, a lot of plants can produce chemicals that affect others. And so the question is, um, using cover crops, what really gives us that weed suppression? Is it the physical barrier? Is it that residue that's out there? Or is it due to allelopathy? Um, rye is one of the ones that is known to have a lot of potential for allele chemicals. I could give you the really long chemical name for this, but I'm going to go with deboa is the short form. And how does this work? Well, rye produces deboa and in the plant, there's a glucose, a sugar molecule that's attached to this 
and it gives it stability, so it's not toxic in the plant. But once the plant is wounded, it's injured, we're spraying it or leaves are falling off, then toxic deboa is released because there's an enzyme that breaks down this deboa glucose molecule mix. And so as the rye cover crop breaks down, we see the deboa, toxic deboa being released and potentially providing weed suppression. And so this was a, a rye cover crop picture that we had here in Manhattan um, early this spring. But um, Yenish published some results to show um, the impact of residue persistence versus the amount of allele chemicals that are there. And so um, in this study, they grew rye, harvested it, planted corn, and then put the rye back in the corn and, to, and in bags and then pulled it out at different times to look at just how quick the residue breaks down, how much residue was left over time. So this was days after cover crop clipping. And so the residue is pretty steadily breaking down through time, but it's this nice linear regular phase that's going through. And basically 50% of the residue was still there after 105 days. It took a long time for it to completely break down. But every time they pulled a sample out, they also measured how much allele chemical was present. And um, here you can see a lot earlier on, but it drops fairly quickly. And then it's flatlined um, here. And if you do a 50%, basically you've got 10 to 12 days after planting corn that you still only have um, some allele chemical there. And so um, often the recommendation is, you know, terminate a cover crop two weeks before planting. Um, your allelopathic chemicals would only be acting like a preherbicide to limit seed germination for that very short window. Um, and so it's, it's, I believe, a lot more of the, res the residue persistence that you're going to get a benefit from. Um, you will get some from allele chemicals, but they are a natural product that breaks down really fast in the environment, and so you won't have it as long as, you, as it's possible. There are differences among the cereal rye um, varieties that are out there. This is a summary of another study. They grew um, all these rye varieties, harvested them, measured the total shoot biomass at that time, and then how much deboa and allele chemical were present. Um, Aroostook is one that um, we often hear is a, a fairly high uh, or good um, rye variety that produces allele chemicals, but you can just see there's quite a, a wide variety. Um, and again, to, to get more deboa, you need more biomass. So I recommend getting, and for me, wheat suppression is the residue. So I'd look for a high biomass producing plant that has some res, um, allele chemical potential. But this just shows the range that you might see. <clears throat> hey, now we're at question number three. And these last ones will go um, relatively quickly. Um, so we need to think about um, what's gonna be before and after the placing of my crop rotation in my crop rotation of where I'm going to put my cover crop because um, this can influence that you want to think about the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the cover crops um, how quickly that will allow the residue to break down if that's an issue and release of any nutrients into your current crop if you were looking at it for producing leg uh, nitrogen with a legume species but you have a high mix of cereals you've got a high carbon then lower nitrogen ratio it'll persist a little longer but as we saw, some of our pea crops by themselves, they'll break down really quick because they have a low carbon to nitrogen ratio. So just needing to think about that. The other key thing, um, as we really promote integrated management systems for weeds that have resistance problems or that we just are, are getting behind the eight ball on is that we need to remember um, what pre-herbicide we have put into the previous crop and, what it and will it persist into the late summer or fall when I plan to seed my cover crops and will they be affected? So what are some of the rotation restrictions that may be um, impacting my cover crop? I don't wanna spend all that money on the cover crop and then not have it come up because my herbicide was persistent um, into the, that season. Um, the other key thing to think about is if you will graze those cover crops, we need to be aware of um, any herbicide restrictions that are in the current crop plant, you know, what will be potentially picked up by the cover crop and to graze. So there's a lot of information out there to manage that. But to look at um, the impact of pre-emergence herbicides on subsequent cover crops, this was a study done um, looking at both, um, it was 
surrounding sweet corn and a dry bean because then they could harvest it in three months time frame. So they sprayed the herbicides, planted these crops in the appropriate herbicide, harvested the crop and then planted these cover crops into that and looked at biomass production afterwards. Each of these herbicides is a one and a two X. So just what would happen if you had a higher level. So uh, a verdict herbicide, something similar to Lumax and then Pursuit or Mazepapir. Um, when they planted oats in the fall, eight weeks after emergence, the A's indicate to me that there were no differences in biomass production um, of the oats in response to any of those herbicides. So they were able to tolerate that. On the flip side, cereal rye, of course, was planted in the fall and not harvested till the following spring, so a longer time period. Again, no statistical differences in cereal rye response to the pre-herbicides three months earlier. But if anyone's tried to grow canola or looked at any of the radishes, we know that um, they're fairly temperamental in regards to any soil, any residual herbicides left in the soil. Often rotation sequences are two to three years before you can plant canola after certain pre-herbicides. And so this table shows a little bit of difference between two years. So again, the weather will play a role. 2013, all A's, no matter, no, no impact. But in 2012, there was some significant reduction in biomass, um, especially, oops, went too fast, um, <clears throat> with the, the increased rate of pursuit and a little bit on the higher end of the, the Lumax rate. So often we need to look at what some of those um, rotational restrictions are um, when we do that. Wow, we finally made it to number four and making a decision about what cover crop could you plant. Lots of different resources available to help you select. Um, the Midwest Cover Crop Council has an online as well as a mobile app that allow you to put what do you want to get out of it and help you make some decisions on your cover crops. Um, I've got Kansas data in there now, so that allows us to use this tool um, as well. Lots of different uh, publications out there, managing cover crops profitably in a number of things. But I highly recommend um, opportunities with field days to see what grows in your area, how things are, are working and, and what seems to be successful. Um, here in Kansas, um, when I really got um, back into this to start talking about it, the NRCS <clears throat> had a good field day and, and had strips of cover crops so we could really see them growing. Just awesome looking turnips, uh, the radishes, um, tall grazing mixes with the sorghum sudan and so on. So this was 2015, I went back the next year and we could barely get a radish to grow. The turnips were uh, dime size. Um, so again, just one year to the next, really big differences in, in the weather and what kinds of things might be successful. Here they had a, a rape that really was doing a nice, uh, was growing really well. And so again, changes from year to year. <laughs> Okay, so finally, <clears throat> you've got a cover crop, you've got it growing, now we know how to need to get rid of it before we get into our uh, cash crop. And so as you think of terminating, we need to think of being able to, to get rid of the cover crop, terminate it, get the um, residue on the surface, as well as what potential species are in that mix, as well as what may still emerge. So again, understanding what weeds you are worried about when they come out. So some of our cover crops, of course, will freeze out. Um, some will require some specific timing and methods. Um, our cereals are still really sensitive to Roundup glyphosate application, so that would work um, for most of those. But if you have a legume in there or some of the rape, then you may need to add a, a growth regulator or some other product. Um, we also, um, as we think about our integrated systems, if you know you got weeds that'll still be coming up, really important to include a residual herbicide in that termination burn down mix to be able to carry um, some weed control into the, the cash crop. <clears throat> in a lot of places, you'll see a standard recommendation of about two weeks before planting a row crop to terminate it. Um, again, um, we're getting a lot more work and, and understanding on this, so I'll talk about that in a second, but it's important to know what your insurance providers, USDFSA or the NRSCS has for local rules on termination timing <clears throat> in order to know that um, you don't lose out um, by doing something different. <clears throat> so examples of termination methods. Um, this is a grower that's using cereal rye um, and comparing again what's what's happening between the bear and the other area, but just did a nice job of terminating that. Um, here's an example again of a roller crimper. 
um, works great on rye, um, maybe not so much on some of the broadleaf. Some of those seem to pop right back up, but again, it depends on the growth stage um, to be able to do that. And here again, um, a grower planted green and would spray afterwards and just looking at the, the, the lack of weeds underneath that, that rye cover crop there. <coughs> So this is a cover crop termination zone map from um, NRCS um, and there's different zones and recommendations of when they uh, want you to terminate your cover crop. Um, so of course for Kansas we've got the whole spectrum of, of colors so we're looking at many different timings that are allowed and, and investigating what what those are uh, for our growers. Of course uh, Iowa you got to split between uh, zone four and zone three Zone four, you are allowed to terminate at or within five days after planting, um, but before crop emergence, um, zone three needs to be done before planting. Um, some of our zones require it to be much earlier, and so we are investigating, can we tighten it up to be more like a zone four and be able to terminate later? Um, so we have been doing some work on that this last summer. Um, spring and summer. Um, uh, this Rexford is out near uh, western part of the state. The grower is growing corn under a pivot and we went in and terminated rye that he had in his field two weeks before on the date of planting and one week post. Um, this is the size of the cereal rye. We can get a lot of growth um, in that time frame to get a benefit of the, more benefit out of that rye if we can delay it. Um, the corn growth stage on June 6th after um, termination no impact of the rye on that yet, no impact on the corn height, but we were able to get a reduction in weed, um, weed counts um, early on, lots of weeds still present, still at planting date, by just delaying it that little bit, we were able to knock down um, more weeds. The grower was also interested in um, strip tilling his corn under this pivot and not terminating the rye, just letting it finish out. Um, we came back to go look at the field and all of a sudden everything was sprayed out. So he must have changed his mind, but we kept the treatment in our experiment um, and we could see that by not terminating it, we could still dramatically reduce those weeds counts quite a bit. There was some impact on the size of the corn where that um, rye was still growing um, and I've got yield data, just um, not all processed yet. But we're seeing you know, folks interested in trying this out um, just to see what happens when I delay my termination. We did the same in soybean. This is um, the same grower that I had looked at before um, near in Clay County. We did one week before planting date, one week post. Again, the rye could grow quite a bit in that time frame so that we had more biomass. No impact on the beans on the earlier ones, a little bit of uh, shorter beans in the one week post, but again, the pigweed population, I could zero it out by waiting till after uh, planting to terminate that cover crop and have my beans coming up. Um, we do have yield data for these. There were no differences in yield across any of this experiment um, for timing of, of termination of the cover crop. So we did not see an impact on the soybeans. <clears throat> So that kind of abruptly ends, but we finally were able to control our cover crops um, after we've planted them and um, observing that we can uh, really have an impact on our weeds um, and suppressing them by using these cover crops. Um, so hopefully that gave you some ideas, things to think about from your own situation um, and where you might be able to fit a cover crop in, but there's definitely benefits of, of suppressing weeds and having something different growing in your field than those weeds. Um, appreciate your attention. Hopefully um, some questions have come up and I'd be happy to, to try to answer some of those for you. Okay, thank you, Anita. And I'll, uh, okay, we have our first question. So is your question about spring planting the rye with the corn? Yes. Let's say you terminate the rye two weeks before you plant the corn. Plant the corn and come afterwards. Okay, sure. All right. Um, it doesn't require protocol. Sure. Anita, I'm going to try to do this. This is a long winded question, but a good one. The question <laughs> is about um, interseeding 
species with uh, with corn uh, for weed control. So maybe you have a rye cover crop preceding the corn that you terminate at the at the proper time, but then you come back after the corn is established with um, two rows of maybe some warm season species or shade tolerant species. If you had any experience looking at that, uh, and if so, would the corn require maybe different nitrogen fertilizer timing or rate? Um, I do not have experience um, with interseeding. Um, we have not really had to push that here in Kansas because our, our season allows us to get more before and after. Um, and with our drier environment, then we're probably not pushing um, something growing with um, the crop. But I think you're, you're thinking the right direction in the sense of probably needing some additional nitrogen um, to overcome what that rye may be holding um, because into your corn crop. Um, so we do, you know, in the state, we have um, a lot of tissue testing and things like that to help monitor what the corn is doing. So that may be a tool to use to see, hey, do I need to side dress some more nitrogen um, in the season or early on. Um, again, that rye, depending on just what kind of stand you had, is really uh, long persistence of the, the residue cover into your crop. So it may be, um, I don't know how late you can get into it to intercede, but it may be that you don't have to push it too much. You're not going to get much legume benefit if you're trying to put that, um, or nitrogen benefit out of legume if you're trying to put that in there though. Sure. I know that um, a number of you in the audience have tried interseeding species to your corn and had mixed results depending on the year. Um, so I, it's something that people are curious about around here and probably elsewhere um, and probably needs a little more playing with and refining before it goes big time. Yeah, and I know more people are doing that out east. I know Michigan State has got a number of folks looking at, you know, when do I start interceding and, and what are some of those dynamics? So. Sure. Okay, yeah. we have another, another question back here. Go ahead. Has there been any discussion of spring, use of spring, barley spring, uh, planted in the fall? Sure. So the question is about using spring wheat or spring barley sown in the fall that will winter kill. Um, the weed benefits of that the following spring or, or I guess what you asked about the use of spring so wheat. Have it killed over the winter. Yeah, I think I know what you're asking. We have done, um, you know, spring oats in the fall um, and, and sometimes with um, you know our radish or something like that that we both know that we know both will freeze out there's no question we are getting some benefit if you've got winter annuals that you're worried about and you've got something else growing there competing you got a residue layer to get you into the spring and may not you know produce as much depends how much you know fall season you have um, there's opportunities to graze that in the fall if people are looking at it at that time as well but um, yeah those work just as well I know that's um, you know, you're investing and it and freezes out, but you're getting some residue cover and you're getting a benefit out of it. Um, the residue just may not be as much and won't persist as long into the spring, but definitely will beat out some of those early spring emerging weeds. Okay, thanks. Uh, she explained the alleliopathic effect as being released after the plant is injured, but you definitely see that even before you do anything. What is uh, the mode of operation of the alleliopathic effect before there's any injury to the plant? I think I heard, I heard the question, I think. Um, you, you know, plants are constantly dropping old leaves, so there's probably some of that available, but I'm really thinking it's a competitive effect that we're seeing um, impacting weeds before it's mostly alleliopathy. I think the, the amount um, of alleliopathic chemical you know, would be relatively low compared to having a good big stand of, of rye growing there. But I think there's some released from the roots as they continue to grow and slough off and then also from, from dying leaves that are in there. But the majority concentration would be as that plant decays. Cool. I'm, I'm going to repeat the question because the question was from up front. I don't think people on the sides heard. The question was about before, or, uh, Dr. Dilly mentioned that the allele chemicals are released from rye once the plant is injured, either by maybe disking or spraying an herbicide, but what is the mode of action when you're seeing rye um, uh, lowering weed pressure before it's been killed? And so the answer was that's probably some kind of competitive nature of the crop growing there and out the weeds. 
hope that was a good paraphrase. Yes, yeah. Okay, we have some questions over on this side, uh, way far in the corner. Okay, the question is about uh, weed pressure and soil test levels so soil uh, fertility balances, soil mineral balances. Is that good paraphrasing? Do you hear that, Anita? Uh, yeah. I'm trying. Um, so, are you wondering if you have high fertility levels, will you have higher weed pressure? Is that so? Maybe if you have, uh, yeah, high higher in one nutrient and uh, imbalance in another nutrient, uh, something like that. Now, a lot of times weeds are indicators that there is something wrong out in the field. Um, it's kind of subtle in the sense of what they might be. And sometimes it's a pH indicator. There's some that love more alkali soils. Kosha is one of those versus, you know, you may see something different. So if you see um, sort of patchiness of weeds, then it may be that they are indicating something different in the place versus another. Weeds are what we might call luxury consumers of some of our fertilizers. So if there's excess somewhere, yeah, sure, they'll grow bigger because they'll take advantage of it and, and you know, excavate it away from the crop. Um, but again, it would be, what weed are you talking about? And maybe it does indicate a certain thing. There's another one over here. Yeah. Is there a point in the point in the bio Okay, so the question is, uh, if a cover crop gets so big, or is there a threshold where the cover crop gets so big that um, you, it's not economical to use a residual chemical um, because maybe that uh, spray, that chemical, won't be reaching the soil surface because of the lush, tall cover crop? Yes, I would probably be balancing out and making those decisions. Um, what we're one of the reasons why growers I think are looking at uh, terminating later in um, that or planting green that sort of thing um, is if you spray too early and the cover crop lays down then you have trouble getting in with a planter and you got you know uh, pinching in the the rows and things like that sometimes you can't get good seed soil contact and so they're going later and so that's where we start seeing more mixtures including the residual because you don't you're running out of time to go twice, um, but then your crop is still standing when you plant. Your cover crop's still standing when you plant and you have less issues with um, thinning and that sort of thing, or if you go later. But definitely if you, um, we are looking at setting up some studies where we are looking at herbicides that are only soil active. So things like the atrazines, the Lumex, acetochlorous products, which are only active on the soil and not in the plant that if we can, um, you know, you may need to, if you've got too much, you're never gonna see the soil, then, then better spray it, get it down, and then put that pre on there. Um, but if you don't have enough, then um, you could combine it. I think that's a good question. I, I don't know what, the, what the, the trigger point is of too much biomass. I would always hope we'd have that much, so. Kind of wishy-washy answer, I guess. I'd, I'd have to, <laughs> you know. I think it's a really good question and I'd, I'd probably be cautious. Okay, yeah, over here. With respect to the building terminations, uh, you see any difference as far as the effect of right here in the right time? What year is the right Sure. So the question was about um, when you delayed cover crop, in some of those last slides, Anita, when you delayed termination of the cover crop to maybe near planting or one week after planting. Do you see a difference in crop performance uh, in a wet year compared to a drier than normal year? If you have those data. Um, I don't. This was our first year um, that we did the study and across the area we were uh, dry. So, um, and in that sense, that's probably not a good thing because, um, you know, that, that, you know, did the cover crop use up more of the water that I'm going to need to to get my crash crop up and going and um, and be successful. Um, 
I think there's multiple questions or ideas going through my mind. One is if it's too wet, can I get in to terminate it? And do I have trouble? And if it's too wet, you know, it's good for my cash crop. Um, in Kansas, it's usually too dry and I'm, is my cover crop using moisture? So we're looking at, um, I think not me personally, but others in our group are looking at um, how do we make that decision? Is it too dry? Do I terminate now so that I can save up rainfall, you know, events to be able to make my cash crop successful? And so I think we're really more flexible. There's those decisions in the spring. It's like, I'd love to wait till after, but I have not had the rain I need to, you know, make sure that when I seed my crop, it'll go. And I don't have any guarantee. I have less guarantee as I move into June and July here in Kansas. So that, those are probably those decisions. Okay, thanks. Okay, one over here. Hi, I came in late, so I apologize if this is answered, but this wife were a little hard to see because it's all the whole stuff. Is she going to take this type of ale? It's being recorded. Okay, so, so that's going to be for her. Yeah. Yeah, those will be available. Sorry, the question, Anita, was about these slides being available later. Some people came in late or couldn't see because we have kind of a large um, room and some small figures on your graph. So, um, okay, question okay. about being able to access those later. So, oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Cool. Uh, yeah, Maggie. <laughs> Okay, I'll try to. Okay, Anita, the question was about, uh, in regards to the previous question about maybe cover crops um, robbing cash crops of soil moisture, maybe in the short term, over long term use, um, might that concern be diminished regardless of a dry year or a wet year? Um, I'd have to. It'd be my gut feel that it's true. <laughs> um, but by having that residue, by building up your organic matter, by, you know, the other benefits that you get out of a cover crop, um, you know, are you conserving that soil moisture? One of the growers that I've been visiting with, he is in far western Kansas, has completely changed his crop rotation to a corn, corn fallow out of a winter wheat fallow system and incorporated cover crops in there and using no-till. And I had to pick his brain because I found it very intriguing. And basically by just putting that residue and keeping it on the soil surface was just able to save more moisture for him to be able to make a corn crop successful in that part of the state where most people wouldn't even look at it. And so those other benefits of the system that you get. So yeah, in the long term, if you've got build up a residue, more organic matter, um, potentially a different rotation sequence that allows you to keep all the water that you need. Yeah. I think there's been work done in the soil physical improvements too over a long time. Yeah. Improvements in bulk density and structure and, and alleviation of compaction that would add to that as well. Yeah, so a lot of our environment is, you know, looking at it in a no-till, how do I put cover crops in there? Because from a weed standpoint, I'm usually, okay, I don't have tillage anymore, so I got to go herbicides. What else can we put into that mix? And so that's where we've been uh, working with, but um, just those no-till folks are, are really seeing that change as well in, you know, in the combination, so. Uh, in the back there. If you remove the cover crop in the spring by topping or bailing, is that going to reduce that chemical composition? Okay, so good question. The question is about um, guessing from a livestock producer. Mm -hmm. um, if, um, if we want to chop that winter cover crop in May, uh, to, as a uh, forage crop, are we going to lose out on the possible um, allelo properties of the of the rye residue, or even some of the weed uh, competition benefits? Uh, probably losing a little bit. You've gained from whatever you've been competing with up to that point in time. Uh, depends how much of that, you know, how low do you cut it. Um, out in the field, you'll have a little bit of that, you know, benefit. But if you're removing all that residue, then, um, you know, you're, you're penciling it out to get your benefit for your livestock. Um, you will have gotten some weed benefit and the other benefits of having those roots there. But um, subsequent weed suppression, probably not. If you know you got a water hemp or a palmer or some other summer annual weeds, um, that may open it up enough that you'll get a few more popping in. 
Okay. Um, Ma'am, did you have one? Yeah. I, uh, to get all the benefits that you're talking about, is it recommended to have a of uh, 100 pounds per acre of land? Question. And if you're going up to 120, is it sufficient? What? <coughs> Right, so Anita, the question was about seeding rate for your cereal rye in the fall. Are you using standard bushel per acre or maybe 100 pounds or even more than that per acre? Yeah, yeah. We, are, we are at that bushel 60 to 100 pounds. Um, unless you've got a mix of something else um, with it, that's where we are as well, so. Okay, um, yeah, you have an act. Go ahead. Is it a question or a, is it a question or a comment? Okay. All right. I'll let it go. I'll let it go because we had a question up here too, but go. I don't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Well, anyway, it's great. It's fine. It's kind of turned gray for about 30 days. First gray has to go like that. It's kind of gray. Yeah. It's handed out. Okay, so we had a personal experience of uh, unsuccessful termination of rye, uh, same day where the beans were planted. Rye came back up, um, popped back up and matured and headed out. Uh, but due to ample rainfall through the season, those were the best soybeans he's ever had in his life. So we don't know what happened there. Okay. You were lucky. Lucky. <laughs> Okay, we got time for one more question, and he was first. Sorry, Fred. The uh, lily path effect with winter rye, as opposed to other crops, triticalia or whatever, did you speak to the uh, mode of action of those? Is it the same chemical compound as in winter rye? And to what degree? Is it charted as the efficacy of a different cover crop? Sure. So, Anita, you probably heard that, but I'm going to repeat it for the rest of the room. The question is, we know that rye has chemical properties. But do any of these other cereals that you spoke of, winter triticale, oats, et cetera, do they have those same properties? And at what levels relative to rye? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, some background reading and looking. Uh, triticale, because it's across a rye and wheat, you'd expect to, but it's much less. Um, and then really not in any of the others. Um, I've actually got an undergraduate student, and we've had um, some interest with our wheat breeding program to look at um, are there potential varieties of wheat that have allelopathic uh, levels that we might be able to explore? So um, I don't think that's been uh, done. There's some hints that there may have a little bit. But again, as we looked at that um, chart, the persistence of that residue is what makes a big difference for um, our cover crop to be persistent and, and that layer of residue to affect weed emergence and that allelopathy is just such a short little window um, of impact. Um, but we are looking at that. Some of our wheat growers um, are concerned if they double crop beans, what kind of impact would that wheat have on my soybeans? And so we are investigating that potential. But um, you know, if you can get good suppression out of those other cereals without the allelopathic effect, um, anything that we could add to that would just be a bonus 